Hey, all you hitches and drifters, it's Haskins the Scarecrow, just dropping in to remind you that this week and next week, Team Tejas will be covering the Snedeker Family Haunting Part 1 and 2. As previously discussed on episodes, these two episodes were recorded quite a while ago. So if they sound like old content, that's because they are. It was pushed off by events like Dolltober. Thank God that's done. But check it out and make sure to give us feedback and remember, keep it spooky. And I'm like, oh, oh, okay. And then I'm like, and I'm keeping the baby. I'm like, all right, it's your body, your choice. And then Brandon walks in like, Logan. I was like, are you pregnant too? Like, no, I have the ass cough and I'm keeping it. And we'll be like, mm, I don't know if you should do that. Anal tuberculosis. <laughs> Welcome to the United States Paranormal Podcast. Sit down and buckle up for an enlightening ride through everything cryptid, creepy, and paranormal. Welcome back, all you hitchers and drifters, to another episode of the United States of Paranormal Podcast, where we are your one-stop shop for everything cryptid, creepy, and paranormal. This is Logan. Sitting to the right of me is Matt Frisbee. Hello, everyone. And right next to Matt Frisbee is Bose. Hello. Look at that. It's go-getter voice. Oh, man. Oh, that was good. He's just, he's, he's working on spite today. Yeah, I don't care. There you go. We dial it up a little bit. He's awake. He's ready to go. Don't worry. Don't worry. I got, I got, I got something for this. So, Bose, how was your week? It fucking sucked. Ah, yeah, but look, he's saying it with gusto, though. So there's a difference there. He's enthusiastically talking about how it sucks. Can we uh, add? Uh, can we add something to the cry counter? Oh, you could add like ten into those. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He's see. He he's disguising it with positivity, but you can see the pain is there. Oh yeah, nothing wakes you up more than getting anally reamed at work. Oh, okay. We're starting off nice here. <laughs> Ooh, Ooh. I think you need to make a complaint yeah, to yeah. HR. <laughs> yeah, no, you should probably elaborate. No, you should elaborate if this is just a fucking. If uh, that's just a mannerism or whatever the fuck you would call it. Dude. And look, and HR. Now, if it just, really was some kind of assault, look, let's not dive HR into it. HR would but. just ask, did they add lube or not? <laughs> oh. So we're continuing with uh, trying to get himself blacklisted from Spectrum. Uh, Are there any I'm names you'd like to drop? No. no. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. But just to clarify, they denied me my raise this week, so Ooh. I am extra pissy. They also threw you in an attic Ooh. with insulation, too. And I, leaned they, you in the ass, apparently. Yeah. Uh, that they seems like a big attic. talking point. They throw me in an attic every night. <laughs> Get up there. <laughs> Weird part is, is even when he's not clocked in, <laughs> they're like, Get over there! <laughs> he's like, but it's hot! You know <laughs> you, you don't can't care. be seen. <laughs> know your place, Spectrum Boy. <laughs> Gotta get that cable ran. <laughs> oh, man. It's rough. Well, Matt, how was your week? Hopefully better than both uh, Busy, but I certainly can't complain. Uh, not that I have uh, anything to brag about, especially no addicts, unfortunately. Uh, mostly just work. It's been a very uh, very busy week for me. I know It's always a sad week when you're not crawling through an attic. Yep, that's that's what I lament. Yeah. not Not having opportunities to crawl through more addicts in my life. Uh, I'm not going to dox what I do because I don't want to uh, lose my <laughs> job. <laughs> but uh, it's the time of year where I have a couple weeks of quite a lot to do. And uh, I also do some freelance stuff that uh, it's very fortunately has been very busy for me and very profitable. So I hear. can't complain. Well, you can technically always complain if you take a book out of Bose's page. You just got to find it, you know? Right. But how fun would this podcast be if... Two thirds. <laughs> We're just sitting here complaining. I'd be the odd one out with optimism. <laughs> this but, would no longer be a paranormal podcast. It would be a mental health podcast. <laughs> Look, some of us need some ways to cope. <laughs> oh, hold on a second. Let me get this. Uh, son of a, get we're this. not doing it again. <laughs> I'm doing it. <sighs> what is it this week? Why even look at the can like you're going to actually say what it is? Well, whenever I say what it is, you shoot it down. Because you can't let us live in illusion. I just don't understand I'm why you're I'm drinking a generic energy drink that has not paid us to advertise them at all. I mean, at their prices, they probably don't have the money for a sponsorship spot. Oh, that's fair. 
That's fair. If there's one thing you can rely on, it's whatever poison they're selling for 99 cents a can. Yeah, I was about to say that looks like a Dollar Tree, like the one. It is 99 cents. It is the Arizona tea of not to insult Arizona tea, because that's actually quality beverage. But he's drinking like a Dollar Tree fucking energy drink. And it's not a Dollar Tree. It's it's OK. It's Venom. Ad drop. It's Venom. I'm telling you, I've seen Venom at the fucking Dollar Tree. Yeah, you can see Monster at Dollar Tree, too. How big of a can of Monster are you getting for 99 cents? I don't know. I'm I just you're saying. Lying. Listen, these got me through high school. And I felt nostalgic when I saw it in there. And you know what? They were 99 cents when I was in high school, and they're 99 cents today. Yeah. Inflation just damn. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> just like those good old boys at Arizona Ice Tea. Yeah. As yeah. a matter of fact, I found out that if you find somebody is upping the price of an Arizona Ice Tea, you can call the company and they will warn the company. Yeah. And if they get another call, they will send a rep out to take everything you know they have off the shelf <laughs> and they will stop selling to that company. Do you think we could get Arizona to? To uh, sponsor the podcast and to have like a skunk ape lemon tea, <laughs> dude, that'd be sick. He just I like the can just a picture of him pissing into a can. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if they've ever had anyone reach out to them for sponsorship. It would have to be a cross sponsorship with us and DC Universe's movies because remember that whole fucking thing with Lex Luthor's speech about is that grandma's or granny's uh, sweet tea or is it piss? <laughs> <laughs> and it just has Lex Luthor holding a jar where skunk cake's taking a leak into it. <laughs> There you go. Multi-cross platform on fucking sponsorship. It leads into a skunk ape comic book. Yeah, this is how you build a franchise. This is how you build an <laughs> extended, extended universe. Yeah, we're we're business geniuses here, so uh, hit us up. And yeah. you gotta think, if it gets made a movie, in our lifetime, we'll get to see skunk ape played by 12 different actors if it's the DCU. Yeah. We will. <laughs> <laughs> we will market slash piss at whatever you send us. <laughs> Poor Skunk Ape, he's like the, he's the fucking like stepchild of all of our fucking mascots, you know? Just be like, can you guess whose flavor it is? <laughs> well, it's not, listen, it's not his fault. The very first art you ever got of him was him pissing on a tent. Listen, it tracks to his story, though. Yeah, I mean, and it's a Calvin and Hobb eventually, reference. Eventually, we will get the serious art of Skunk Ape done. Eventually, it will happen. And Calvin then hopefully and he gets Hobb some merch reference. love. Yeah, uh, pretty sure what was that? What did a uh, Dennis the Menace? No, Cal no Calvin the, the, the the back of vehicles where you have yeah, people I pissing that was on stuff. Dennis no. the Menace. Oh, no, that's Calvin, that's and, Calvin Hobbs. and Hobbs. And the guy, the Waterson, the dude that made it, fucking absolutely hated that. That's what his character got utilized for. Because the person that made that first sticker he had no rights to, but yeah. there was no putting that fucking that pickle back in the jar oh, after I it think, got out there. I think vinyl window decals is a market that's like. Licensing be damned. Well, yeah, because good luck fucking putting a fucking into it. Yeah. A bazillion fucking cricket. people out there putting your fucking character, the Punisher logo, out on fucking racist people's trucks and shit. So nothing you can do about it. Mm -hmm. Except for change the logo on Punisher <laughs> and then all of them be like, it's stupid. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know what to fucking tell you there. But Skargate will eventually get the love he deserves. Eventually we'll get the more serious art done. We have plans to have a logo with him, just doing the Bigfoot walk. With a mic in his hand and like headphones on or something. Can we put well, a bucket spoiler. in front of him? No, we're gonna we gotta have some non piss related <laughs> merchandise for Skunk Ape. Now I will yeah. say that I do have a nice pint glass of Skunk Ape pissing on a tent. It looks great. It looks great. I don't see the problem. Especially here. with lemonade. Yeah, and you know I've had a lot of people ask me about the Skunk Ape stickers. So there's that. People enjoy it. People oh, enjoy the it. Skunk Ape stickers are very popular. Very yeah. popular. So I mean, so if you would like some stickers, get fucked. <laughs> <laughs> because we you aren't know, selling them on our merch store. Yeah, no, no, now see listeners uh, if you would like a sticker you can if you email me I'll send you a fucking sticker but that's going to require you to actually get the email and do it now at the end of our podcast we have a plug that has our email Does, uh, now, yeah. now when this episode and, and, and comes and it's easy. out it, it is easy it's the United States of Paranormal at gmail.com now, when this episode actually releases, what do you think will be the odds of us having the merch store up? The merch store has been up the whole time. Uh, uh, yeah, our merch. Okay, so so this is what he's getting at. This is confusing uh, as it goes, listeners. And I know our opening's running a little long here. Uh, when we started this podcast, we have Team Tejas itself had already done multiple episodes before it was even out on a streaming service at all. And before it even launched, we had merchandise. Uh, but the thing is, is we filmed, we recorded so earlier on that we didn't plug any of these things because it just wasn't 
happening yet. But by the time you guys heard our first episode, we had an established merch store already. Because we're very optimistic. Yes, we are. And it is called the Merch Mozzie Limb. And we've got all things from leggings with cast per. Yeah, now, now, you can't sue me because it's cast dash per. Cast per. Not Casper. Nothing to do with that. Leggings, t-shirts. We've got Haskins the Scarecrow on everything. We even have some Skunk Ape merchandise out there. Uh, some Golden Oldies t-shirts. And it's an ever-extending endeavor because there's, a, there's tons of merch we want to do. And if we were more well-off people, we would do it constantly, but it takes money and time and resources. So showing love by stopping in the merch store, we appreciate it. Yeah, if we got nothing else, we at least have some bomb-ass merch. Yeah, I mean, I, every time I'm not at work, I'm wearing a United States of Paranormal t-shirt of some variety right now. I'm wearing my uh, road sign for Team Tejas. He actually threw everything out of his closet just for our merch, and I he only as, has two shirts. I might as well. <laughs> Excuse you, I have six shirts at this point. Yeah, but uh, I might as well throw out the rest of my clothes because what I'm always wearing. At this point, it's nice quality merch. Feels great. Yeah. Love and it. I mean, why not shamelessly plug? Exactly. We have no pride. We don't. We are willing to sell ourselves for anything. Please pay us. But yeah, that's just kind of let, letting you guys know that like if it, the, our, our, our recording schedule is a little bit wonky because it's like we're not we're not recording like we don't hear an episode of the Boozers episodes and then go and record the next week. We by our our episode that comes after a Boozers episode was recorded weeks usually before, and so we can't we don't really reference each other Months because even. it doesn't work like that for us. Now they can reference us usually because they've heard our stuff before they do other episodes, but it's not the same for us. But the merch is out there. We're also on Instagram, Twitter, all that jazz, YouTube. And like I said, we have an email. If you want a sticker, send me an email. Give me, tell me a spooky story you want us to cover, or just give us feedback. I'll send you a sticker. I'll send you a sticker of Skunk Ape pissing on a tent. I'll send you a sticker of a ghost. I'll, I'll send you whatever sticker you want. Or just tell like, us how much you hate model. us. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. That is, uh, you got to do a lot more than just email me for that sticker. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, we have confirmed that that sticker exists and is now canon. Oh, it's out there. It is out there. Full on Burt Reynolds spread. Yeah. Yeah, sexy. But that being said, uh, my week was all right. Uh, nothing big to talk about, really. Uh, I think we've done a, enough for the opening. We should. Well, dive wait, in wait, 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 wait. This is the first time we've recorded since your big event. We do have something you could talk about. We What's do. That? Oh, you talking about the spooky stuff? Yeah. yeah. Good Lord, this is going to run. This is already going to be our first two-parter podcast. And on top of that, this. Okay. So this week, and I know how it's going to sound, listeners. I completely understand. The guy that has a spooky podcast had a spooky incident. Like, oh, ooh, uh, what's the odds of that? I feel you. I would say the same thing. But I also, hey, another thing, if you email me, I could send it to you. I have video and audio of the events that took place. Now, the guys already hear this because I shamelessly called them at 12 o'clock at night on a work night. Video called them both when it was happening. Um, I was laying in bed with Kayla. We were watching. What were we watching? I'm trying to think here. Uh, so, probably at that time point in time. Let's go nuts. It was, it's either Ghost Ventures or Sons say, of Anarchy. Uh, it's one of the two. Uh, and while we're doing it, uh, Spotify kicks on. Okay, so I struggle to get Spotify turned off. When I turn off Spotify, I can hear my three-year-old, or about to be three-year-old, uh, Bean Dip at her door. She's just all of a sudden at her door, and she's crying. So I go to the room. I pick her up. I put her back down to bed. She goes back to sleep. And then her sister, Essie, sits, like, just right angles, just sits right up, eyes still closed, and just asks for a hug. I give her a hug, and she lays back down. Now, normally, if this kid's up, it's an endeavor to get her to go back to bed. But she just went back, went right back to sleep. Go lay back down, and as soon as I lay back down, Kayla gets a call. It's her mom, who lives right across from us in our apartment complex. We're the top floor. She lives right across the way from us. Uh, she's called Kayla because her cat, Monkey, has attacked her, right? And she's upset, and like Kayla's like, I'm going to go open the door for her. And in my head, it's a house cat. Uh, I'm like, oh, it's, it's, it's she probably just jarred her at bitter or something. It's no big deal. Um, so I'm sitting in bed, because I'm like, I'm not going to put clothes on. But... Then I hear Kayla's mom sobbing, so I put on my basketball shorts and I walk in the living room, and it's a, f it, it, does, it just was so fucking jarring because this woman's arms and chest and legs are just dripping with blood everywhere. And it looks like she got attacked by Freddy Krueger, not a fucking house cat. So uh, instantly I'm like, what the fuck? 
and she's crying. So Kayla's getting her cleaned up. So my, I'm like, I'll go over to your house. I'll get the cat into the back room and sealed away. So if you need to go back home, you're fine. It'll be locked away. Cause, and it's weird because it's her, been her cat for like six something years. It's like she's had this cat forever. It's her best friend. Um, I get in there and she has two cameras uh, that are facing out her kitchen window that she uses to uh, watch outside because there we have apartments. Stuff's been sketchy. I've had a motorcycle stolen out from the apartments before. Um, and you can hear me talking to this cat because the cat's being fucking weird. And I've got a I've got a lid to a tote box in one hand and a sheet in the other trying to because I saw what he did to her. I'm not about to fucking live that lifestyle. I'm not about to get attacked <laughs> by the cat. So I'm just yelling at this cat. I'm not even yelling. I'm kind of trying to calmly talk to him, like, go back this way. And I'm pushing him, and he's fighting me. He doesn't want to go. And eventually, I get him coerced back in the room, and her, her sister is now staying there, but not there at the time. So she has her big orange cat, Fred, there. So poor Fred looks traumatized, too, because he witnessed the whole event. He witnessed somebody of his species try to take down a human being, and he's like, can we do that? <laughs> He's just confused and he's scared. So I start it's like, is it time? Yeah. So I start talking to him. I'm like, it's okay, Fred. It's come here. Come here. I'm trying to pet him. I'm trying to get him to come out. So I take a few steps back towards the front door. Uh, now, and I'm talking to him. And while I'm talking to him, like the house feels, the, the living room feels a little weird. It feels, the air feels thick and it's not cold. It's like 71 degrees in the house, but my spine feels cold. And I've got like chicken skin everywhere. And then all of a sudden I hear like this little, I'm going to call it a candelabra, but I don't know what the fuck it's really called, but it's just like this little metal structure that's housing a bunch of tea lights and glass things that they sit in. And it's right next to a lamp that has a lampshade. It starts to shake. And then the lampshade, I'm doing so many hand motions and there's not even a camera in here, tilts to the left. And you just hear me on this camera. You don't see me, but you hear me on this camera go, what the fuck? And then you abruptly see me leave the house and run over to my apartment because my eyes started to just water instantly as soon as it shook and like i so i ran across the way and i just go talk to kayla and her mom i'm like something i didn't even i didn't even sugar go sugarcoat it i walked in there i'm sure i look like a fucking victim of some sorts because my eyes were still watering when i walked in there i was visibly shook and i'm like something fucking weird is going on in the house i was like it's something's off it feels weird uh the cats are acting weird when they get in the living room specifically i was like this shit shook this moved and I was like, it's insane. So then I go, I gear up to go back over there a few times. And then eventually I come back over and Kayla's mom was planning on leaving in the first place. So I go to get her stuff and she's like, can you guys slide some food under the door for Monkey, the cat? Well, so you walk in the front door and then as the farthest you can get away from the house is where the cat, the door is, is where the cat is. So Kayla walks first and I'm right behind Kayla. She's crouched down, sliding food through the door and I'm right behind her. And before we even walked in the house, I turned on my recorder on my phone because I'm like, I I believe in paranormal and clearly something's going on. So I'm like, I'll have my recorder going. So if there's something that we can't hear, maybe it will hear it. Not expecting what's about to happen. Otherwise I would turn my fucking camera on instead. But then again, even the camera's on, I would have been facing the wrong fucking way. We're sitting there and you just hear this loud fucking thud. Just whoosh. And I'm like, you just hear Kayla go, what the fuck was that? And I turn around and I notice on the wall near the door where she has two massive crucifix. And this one is just pure metal. The one crucifix is no longer on the fucking wall. And you just hear me in the video like, we're fucking leaving. And she's like, why? And I was like, that was the fucking crucifix just fell off the wall. We're going. And we get up and we fucking leave. And I call Matt back. And because Bose is already asleep at this point. And I pick up the crucifix, the big metal crucifix off the floor. And I hang it back on the wall. And on the video with Maddie, and he contested this, I, I swing this thing back and forth. I smack it. I try to jar it to get it to fall off the wall and nothing. Like I'm swinging this thing side to side. I'm smacking it down. I'm smacking it up. It's not going nowhere. Because one, it's the, the mounting system is secure in the wall. It's in a fucking stud. It's up there good. And two, it's not like it's hanging on something, the crucifix. Somebody drilled out in this pure metal crucifix a hole and it's just sitting in there. I'm swinging it back and forth. I'm hitting it. It's not coming down. It's staying there. So I'm like, this is fucked. I was like, and it only feels weird in the kitchen. And I've showed, at this point, I've showed Matt. I've showed Bose. I've showed them the goosebumps on my skin and explained to them everything. And Kayla goes to leave. And I have a video of this because there's two times where she walks in. because She's going in and out of the house because she's trying to secure us to where we have the rights to access the, the footage because I'm moving a camera 
mm-hmm. from one of the, from the window to face the living room. So in case anything else happens, they can catch it. Uh, and when she's doing this, she walks in and it spooks me like twice because I'm so on edge when she just walks to the door. I'm like, oh! uh, but I start walking around the house and right before I'm about to walk in the living room, I catch on the thing. The candles doing it again. They just shake. You hear them clearly rattle. The glass things just start to rattle. I'm like, what the fuck is that? And it rattles. So like something, albeit I don't know what or why, it, it was just camping out in that living room. And it was fuck. You could just, you, I cannot explain. And I probably said it like 30 times while I was talking to the guys. It was like, I wish you were here because I cannot justifiably explain to you what this living room feels like. It doesn't, the rest of the house doesn't feel like this. The cats only act weird when they get in the living room. So, like, we locked it up. Kayla's mom went wherever she was going, and we left it there. And the next day, I went to St. Anne's, and I talked to Father McCready, and I got some holy water, and I gave it to Kayla's mom to do whatever she wants to do with it. But it was fucking beyond bizarre. And, like, I cannot... Everybody I've told this story to, it's just been like, I tell them about the cat, and they're like, oh, cat. And then I show them pictures, and people are like, what the fuck? Because, like, it is fucking gnarly. Yeah, it's not just like a cat got yeah. mad and swiped at you or something. That cat... Was trying Assault- to take down yeah. a larger animal. Yeah, like that cat assaulted her. It was fucking horrible. But like it was, it was insane. I can't. And I spent the whole next day doing research, trying to figure out like how many people died in these apartments that have been around since 1973. Which and it just fifteen's the number. Yeah, but that's also only when they, if you look at the records, that's like from 2000 on was like when they started taking records of it. So there's no telling how many people died there from so 73 to 2000. People died. In 20 years. In 22 years. And, and yeah. they're, they're not like, this person died in this apartment, or this person died in this apartment. It's just like, they died. Yeah, and this building is what, 45 years old? So 1973 was when it was put up. So, oh, so 49 years old. So I'm just, uh, like I said, it was fucking, it was, it was crazy. Like I said, I called the guys in the middle of the night because I was like, this is unbelievable. But it's just like, it, it, was like it, it was like a whole event. It started at a certain time, and it just, it just cooked. I hadn't been back in the house just to check on Monkey, but not, outside of that, I haven't done shit. And I just like, like I said, it was beyond. It was enough to where I, I was concerned enough to where I went to the big ass Catholic church here in Beaumont. And, <laughs> like, please help. Yeah, I was like, yo, <laughs> I was like, you ain't got to go there or nothing, but I know you got something here, Padre. <laughs> like, which, and then he gave me a bottle of holy water, which he has a sticker on it where he can write like instructions for like if I wasn't going to use the rest of it, how to dispose of it. Yeah, and, it's really weird that it said apply rectally. Yeah, I know, right? And <laughs> it was like, yeah, he went to the back room for like a couple no, of minutes. No, let's not. He was nice enough to give it. Father McGrady was nice enough to give it to him. Let's not besmirch him. But it was, it was gnarly, man. And like I said, uh, if you guys want to hear some of the audio or catch a video or something, hit us up at our email, the United States of yeah. Paranormal yeah. at gmail.com. It is just the United States of Paranormal, isn't it? It's not the United States of Paranormal podcast. I'm pretty confident it's United States of Paranormal. Let us double check that real quick, so I'm not sending y'all on a wild goose <laughs> chase here. Now, also, if you go to our Facebook page, yeah, which just is United, United States of Paranormal at gmail.com is our yeah. email. Or you can go to our Facebook page, which is United States of Paranormal, or our Twitter, which, once again, is United States of Paranormal. Um, you can also get links to uh, our email from there as well. Yeah, and also it- our merch store. Yeah, we like I said, we'd love to hear from you. And if you want to see video or anything like that, I'd be glad to send it to you. If you hit us up on any of our socials yeah. or email, leave reviews, leave or comments. If you have an experience that's also like that or know somebody has, we'd love to hear from you and talk to you about it too. So, but that being said, it's probably time that we dive into this week's case, especially since it's a massive one. Alrighty. Uh, this week trip takes us to Southington, Connecticut with the Snedecker family. Yes, I know it's a weird name, but that is their name, the Snedecker family. Snedecker. But before we go to Connecticut and drive into this, uh, dive into the spirits and the utter mayhem of this case, we have to start where the family started, and that was in their home in New York in the year of 1986. Now, have either of you heard anything of the Snedecker family? It's a kind of a name that sticks out. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I can't say I have. I know you're both not big ghost movie people, and we're slowly converting you to that. But like, this is another one that was had a movie that was based on or true events thing where they loosely interpret it and make the movie. And that is for our listeners out there, the haunting in Connecticut. Oh, okay. Which I is actually I, a really good yeah, movie. I'm pretty sure I've seen That's that cool. movie. Now that being said, if you're a fan of that movie, uh, and you want to keep it that way, <laughs> this might not be the episode for you because I'm a huge fan of this movie. And let me tell you what, after doing my whole research, like I said, this is gonna be a two parter. I now view all those characters a lot differently. <laughs> Oof. Yeah. But uh, well, let's just get into it. Uh, now, this story starts out bleak with the eldest of Carmen and Alan's three sons, Philip, being diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. 
which is lymphoma. Lymphoma, which is a basically a type of throat cancer. Almost. Well, specifically, it's cancer of the lymphatic system. Matt, which knows is you are, my mother suffers from lymphoma, Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, well, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. It's which is different. It is because specific, but, specifically, it's not it's not Hodgkin's lymphoma. It's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. <laughs> Anyway, the point is, the lymphatic system, uh, it consists of your lymph nodes, uh, your, uh, what are they called up here? You're asking the wrong person. Your, what, like your thyroid, or? No, not, well, uh, yes, uh, everything that produces white blood cells is part of the lymphatic system. Yeah. Uh, it's how you fight illness. Well, you can tell we are medical big brain. Basically, <laughs> yeah. how they found out that their son had it is he, one day, they noticed a lump on his neck. Yeah, and then it got bigger and bigger, and that led to them taking him to the hospital. Yeah, where it was a whole massive endeavor where they end up doing a biopsy and finding out that he had a lot of fucking cancer in his neck, like a whole lot. Exactly Whoa. six cancer. It was a lot of cancer. <laughs> all right. Uh, while the family lived in upstate New York, this ended up being a massive issue for the family, seeing how Phillips cobalt treatments were daily. And it took place in the Uncom Hospital in Southington, Con Connecticut. A trip that, without traffic, takes up to three and a half hours. But if you know New York, traffic has been and always will be an issue. There were times where Carmen said it took 12 hours total Ooh. to get back. Now, on top of that, that's with, that's with a son crying from his treatments and sickness and pain. Like, at one point, Carmen thought that the car ride itself was going to be what killed her son in the long run because it's just every day driving all the way there and all the way back now driving there is one thing but coming back after the cobalt treatments and the radiation yeah. and everything was a fucking well, and nightmare. anyone who's been yeah. on a long trip who's been in a car that long like it is exhausting even if you're not driving like just sitting in a vehicle for that long is tiring Oh yeah, and like I said you're I've I've heard tales of people that have gone through radiation and everything else their their bones hurt yeah. physically afterwards. So imagine being in a car in the fucking seventies, just driving through all these roads and stuff, just being rattled and not being able to get comfortable. Yeah, that's. And I'm sure treatments back then were far worse than they are today. But yeah. essentially, for those of you who don't know what radiation treatments and what chemotherapy treatments do, they kind of just kill everything. Yeah, and what's healthy tends to grow back and the cancer doesn't. And that's how it gets rid of the cancer. So it's an incredibly painful experience to recover from. And yeah, it's, I'm surprised they didn't like get a, get a, since it was daily, they didn't try to get some kind of temporary lodging or something. I also don't know if like how pro I know that stuff's more prominent now, but I also don't know how prominent stuff like that was offered back in the seventies either. Like if they had a lot of hospital housing and stuff, that's actually something the landlord uh, ended up bringing up when she will get there, but uh -huh. uh, the landlord basically was starting to op own more property because of that, because it was near that hospital. And he was literally like, I'm buying up houses out in this area so people can have a place to stay. Oh, look at this guy. Good guy. Landlord. Yeah, that's what that's he was awesome. doing. Is he was being a good guy. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get into that. But uh, basically, so one day after a long trip uh, to the treatment, Carmen called her husband and told him she was going to go looking for a place to rent locally while Philip was getting his treatments and uh, checkups done. Uh, since Carmen was looking to rent and not buy, she had an extremely hard time in this time frame trying to find a place that would take her large family considering she had four kids of her own and two of her nieces who would also be living with her and her husband. So that's fucking, that's a massive family. And apparently back, she, she's on record multiple times saying back then that like, if you just said you had kids in that area, they weren't really wanting to rent to you, let alone having four of your own plus two. Oof. Yeah, it was it was fun. Well, and you're rough. And on top of that, she's trying to find something in a budget last notice because she what the plan was was that her husband was gonna have to stay up in New York until he could get a transfer down to Ooh. there. So they were having to float that and the bill of moving and the hospital treatments. And a new place, which, you know, every place is like first and last months and everything. So, yeah. And now this is also something that they like with the movie that they glance over is like they made it sound like they bought this house, which they did not. They rented the home. They weren't landowners. They didn't own the place. They rented it. 
uh, but hope was not lost, or so it seemed, as she pulled up to a massive house that she thought clearly had to be a mistake on the price. Because it is a big, old, like, plantation-era, massive fucking house. And she was getting turned away from apartments that were smaller and more expensive in this place, so she thought that clearly this was just a mistake in the newspaper listing. Uh, so there, she thought, there's no place, there's no way this place is affordable. Uh, upon entering the house, she was greeted by tons of workers, busy remodeling the house. Upon talking to the owner, she was delighted to know that the rent was right. It was a great deal. And she was informed that there was even more space to be had downstairs in the basement. The owner explained it could be divided into two separate rooms down there. But as of now, the basement was not accessible, being that the worker's equipment had the door blocked off as a whole. So basically what she ended up doing when she got there is originally she only viewed an upstairs part of it. Uh, This is something that I'm going to talk more about in the second part, but... There is so many documentaries and shows and interviews about this case. And there's a lot of inconsistency with stuff. Now, the actual book about this case, uh, they discuss the fact that this house is split. She is not the only family that's going to be there. This house is so, it was a three story house, not including the basement. Uh, and it was going to be split into apartments. Uh, top middle and bottom and the bottom having the plus two rooms in the basement. Right. And when she originally went there, she only saw the above the top floor apartment. She loved it. So when she signed the lease, she signed the lease, not knowing what her house was going to look like because she thought she was going to get up top, but she ended up him being like, I can give you the bottom. He was like, it'd work better for you. There's more rooms downstairs. And also I think it's the landlord not wanting to rent the highest floor to a family with six kids. Yeah. They're yeah. going to drive the people below him fucking insane, you know, and then he's just going to nonstop hear about it. But that is like one of the only forms of media where they talk about, especially in the movie, you know, they shave that shit out because it's not going to be super spooky. If you're like, I live in the haunted duplex. <laughs> you know? So they may hey, not like the whole house was theirs, but hey, it the never was. The girl family was a haunted duplex. Yeah. I'm just saying, but they cut it out in the movie. They definitely <laughs> were like, Oh, they own the whole house was yeah. not the case. At all. Uh, maybe I'm jumping the gun here. So do we hear about any instances from the other people living in the house? We will get to that in the second okay. part. But that, like I said, I just want to let you know that like this, they didn't get the whole house for cheaper than they get the apartments. Yeah. They got the bottom section of the house, right? That's still probably larger than a lot of the apartments oh, yeah, no, that massive. they would have had to have I mean, when me and Caleb lived in Indiana, we lived in a house that was set up similarly. Like it was an original plantation house that got divided into four different apartments. Wow. And the bottom apartment that we lived in was bigger than people's houses that I know. Like, it was just so fucking huge. And it was just only a section of that house. Uh, But like I said, so she basically signed the lease sight unseen. She didn't know what the basement was going to look like, hadn't been in there at all, barely looked at the bottom floor apartments because she went upstairs and looked at the top floor. Uh, Carmen had seen everything she needed to know, or as far as she thought. Like I said, because she thought she was getting the top floor apartment. So she did not hesitate. She signed the lease and then and there and informed her husband that uh, her and her son, Philip, were staying there. He can get the rest of the family pack and start moving soon, but she wasn't going to take Philip back to New York this time. She was done with it. Why? You have an apartment now. You've paid for it. Why drive him all the way back there to make him help pack and everything when everybody else can do it over there and just bring everything, you know? Just let the boy rest and everything. Yeah. Stay down. Basically, yeah, basically. Uh, Don't move. Uh, oh, if I find out you moved an inch, so oh, help me. <laughs> You'll be going out in the woods and picking out your own switch. But like I said before, uh, the, the he would get the whole family there, but Alan would not be staying with them, the husband, uh, because he had to, like I said, he had to stay up in New York and keep working for the foreseeable future until he could get a transfer, uh, which, like I said, that also put a financial bind on the family. Uh, They're paying for two apartments, medical treatment, this and that. And he was also, he was commuting on the weekends because he wanted to spend time with his family. So he was still paying the gas for that trip. He would come in Friday night, leave Sunday night. Uh, but it was not long at all before the family started noticing strange events. Almost instantly, actually stuff would keep going missing, then springing up in weird places. And to be fair, with family that just moved in and has a small gaggle of kids, so shit goes MIA every now and then, uh, you know, but nobody would ever own up to being who moved the stuff. And on top of moving stuff, uh, Philip 
and his younger brother started getting situated in the basement, right? Which is like, a lot of people complain about this. Is like, why the fuck did you chunk the cancer patient kid in the basement? Like, why is he the one that got the one of the basement right, bedrooms? In the dark, and it's not a like, damp it's room. not a like, oh, he was like of that age where he's like, I want the basement, I want independence. Because when he first got there, he refused to stay in the basement until his brother moved in, his younger brother. He did not want to be in the basement alone. Did not like it. Did not. He didn't feel comfortable down there. He actually was on record telling his mom when they first got there, he wanted to leave instantly because he felt the house was evil. But then, you know, you have your kids telling you this and then you're like, basement. Oh, don't be a baby. But until his brothers and sisters and everybody moved in, he slept in the living room on the couch. He refused to sleep downstairs until he got there. Um, sorry, I lost my spot here. Um, but he would, uh, when his, his brother finally moved in, they settled in. There was two rooms for the brothers side by side and another room that was locked off. Uh, now, the boys being the boys, they were curious. Uh, they, they managed to get in the room that was locked off and they started to notice weird things like multiple drains in the floor. And being that their interest was piqued, they snooped more and ended up forcing a, open another door that was sealed, and upon doing so, they uh, they were instantly enlightened to why their new home was so goddamn cheap. Uh, the boys began to move around this room, examine an embalming table in the middle of the room. Oh, oh no! Uh, a bunch of mortuary stretchers, uh, opening the many doors to all the mortuary coolers, and even in rifling through all the tools left behind that had become very clear to the kids that their new home used to be a home to the town's dead. They, their house was a converted funeral home. Man, you won't play doctor? Yeah. Death. Death. Ooh. Okay, so after the parents were brought up to mm. speed, uh, even though it was profoundly disturbing, they knew they had no more cash for a second move. And then on top of that, they would not be able to ever find a deal like this. Even if they did have the monies, uh, the family was staying. They, they, they had no choice. They knew it was creepy. My problem with this is like, after you find out the is what it is, move the almost terminally ill child out of the basement with the morgue. You know, yeah. So like, you like, know, at that point, it's your job as the parents to take the bullet. You take the basement at that point. They're like, you know what? Uh, you're probably no, gonna be Brandon. No, I know where you're going with it. We're not <laughs> it's making, always somewhere we're terrible. We're not making dead kid jokes. <laughs> we're gonna move past that. Uh, <laughs> God damn it! Ah, lame. Uh, you know, it doesn't need to happen. <laughs> So, uh, like I said, they, they were staying. They weren't going anywhere. Uh, they were just going to move past the odd past of the house, and the spiritual residence had other... Uh, but the spiritual presence had another idea for the family. It wasn't going to be ignored. And if anything, now that everybody's emotions were cranked up and people were already on edge, the activity was going to just kick it up a notch. But mainly it was going to kick it up a notch for the poor boys that were taking residence in the basement. And I know what uh, a lot of you people are thinking. You're like... Why would it be haunted? These people didn't die in the house. Their corpses were there, right? This, uh, that depends. This, we will get there later. I promise you in part two, we will dive into why the house was haunted, but you just got to trust me. Uh, I was just going to say, like, a lot of times when the body hits the funeral home, the brain isn't necessarily dead yet. <laughs> yeah. I got to be like that. But I'm going to circle back to you, you, you after you figure out that you found out what that house was, my first step personally would have been moving the boys out of the basement. Especially after figuring out the layout these boys shared, what used to be called the casket display room. Jeez. Yeah. Ew. <laughs> it happened you know. to be right down the hall from the previously discovered embalming room. Now, call me a prude or sensitive, but uh, don't you think that maybe you should not let the teenager fighting cancer sleep in a casket display room? I'm pretty sure death was already constantly on this kid's mind, and now it's just cranked up to 11. Oh, well, yeah. And these are rooms that are made to be, like, cold. Oh, yeah. And, like, and this is in upstate New York? 
No, this is in Connecticut. But oh, still, Connecticut. still cold. And on top of this, the family yeah. ended up utilizing the mortuary coolers to keep groceries cool, too. Oh. Because there is a point in time where Steve, uh, Philip's mom sends him downstairs before his brothers and sisters moved in to go get ground beef out of one of the coolers. Like, just think about this. That sounds like it would be miserable for you know, a healthy person to sleep. Well, the setup is beyond creepy anyways, because the room that was locked off that the boys managed to get into Uh was just a big like uh you know that like that that uh that fogged that permanently fogged glass Mm -hmm. that they have that you clearly it's glass but you can't see in. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, It was just a wall, a door like that, and two giant fucking fogged in windows that led to that room. So you could get a basic idea of what's going on in there, but you not a clear picture. And that comes into play. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, not surprisingly at all, uh, sighting seemed to start with Philip. The first night, him, he, he, that he slept down there, he slept so poorly. Uh, Philip recalls being shook from his sleep by the overwhelming sense of anxiety. As his eyes opened, he claimed he could hear a doorknob rattling down the hall. Mm. And if you remember, what down the hall was, was the embalming room. Now, upon Philip looking over at his brother, he clearly could see he was still in bed. Uh, and then he has slow creak of the embalming room door opening. As much as he did not want to, Philip cleared his eyes of the sleep and focused his glare towards the door, where he could clearly see a tall man with long black hair and highly defined cheekbones whose skin looked to be tight for the frame of his face, peeking out from behind the door the man was just staring back at Philip without moving. Nope. Yeah, so this it's already a terrifying place, and this boy sees this door with that, fo- like I said, the fogged glass just slowly creak open, and it's not even like somebody fully stepped out. It is a tall-ass man with tight skin, which to me, when it's defined like that, sounds like a corpse, you know? Yeah. He says that the skin seemed too tight for his frame, so it just sounds like skin that is decomposing like tightly gripping everything uh, just peeking out enough for him to see his face and just making eye contact just with looking and be like the kids asleep <clears throat> as horrified as he was philip laid back down and tried to sleep in his head he tried to rationalize it as a dream or hallucination possibly brought on by his illness or maybe even the treatments but as days went on that was harder for him to use as a crutch to why things were happening can you imagine being a kid like roughly like 13 and like you already have to deal with cancer? Yeah. And now you found out your room, not only is your house an old funeral home, but you sleep right next right. to the embalming room where they, there was literal drains that led to blood tanks because they had to have separate blood tanks for that building because you are not allowed to dump blood into the sewage. There was a literal elevator type set up in there to bring readied bodies in caskets up to the display room for people coming to say goodbye to their dead relatives. Right. Imagine complaining to your parents. They're like, yeah, I'm seeing corpses. They're like, ah, it's just a cancer yeah. in the brain. Calm down. There was, there was furnaces, coolers. Like I said, the embalming table that was permanently fixed in the middle of that room. Oh, no. Stuff that you have to, in your room that you're living in, was the casket display room. Like, it's it just, it's fucking, I just... Parent of the yeah, year. It does make, and these parents did catch a lot of shit. And honestly, I am right there with them. Like, you should have moved that little bastard out of that room. You yeah. should have been down there. Yeah, like, like the kid's going through something. You should be trying to make his life comfortable. Yeah. Not stick him in probably the worst place on earth. Uh, like I said, it was harder and harder for him to try to like push it off. Like he kept trying to be like, it's not, it's just, maybe it's my brain or maybe it's the, the treatments, but because now regularly, Philip could hear someone nightly calling out to him by name from the embalming room. Phil- and the casket pipings uh-huh. at that point, the brother just, uh, he would hear him in the casket piping too, which if you don't know what casket piping is, it is literal like tube shaped things they had in the wall where they would store fucking caskets. And he could hear people calling his name out from those. Just dark mm. tubes in the fucking wall. Can you imagine that? You're laying in bed and you hear your name being uttered from just a hole in your wall. The where it had enough room for a casket. To sit that's comfortably. like, that's some it level stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Like, if it was me and that was happening, I would just go upstairs 
And if the parents ask me, like, look, well, no, I'm sleeping here in the living no. room. Well, we're about to get into that, okay? So uh, at this point, his little brother's hearing all the shit, too. It's not just him. So the brothers try to tell their father, who is only there Friday night to Sunday night, because he is staying in New York still during the weeks and everything for work. The father would snap at Philip, claiming he is making stuff up to scare everyone else and that he better stop. They were con- his mother and his father, mainly his father, would constantly blame Philip, saying that he was put it. They first they blamed him, saying that he told all their siblings after they tried to keep it from the siblings what the place was. They claimed that Philip told them all, and he was trying to actively scare them. Okay, all. so this is generic horror dad, movie dad. dad. Yeah, no, this yeah. dad is. They so this is our first shitty dad. They portray this dad okay. pretty. They they try to make the dad seem a little bit better in the movie, but then they kind of dive in him being shitty. But yeah. like. We'll get into the dad even more in the second part, but no, he is, the dad was just like, he would snap at him constantly and just be like, you're just trying to freak everybody out. Yeah, that because that's what you want to do with the cancer kid. You want to make him feel yeah. guilty okay. about everything. And we're going to dive into that. See, now before the family moved, they oh. had a great dynamic and Philip and his siblings were extremely close. Uh, uh, sorry, I lost my spot for a second there. Uh, like I said, Phil, Philip and his siblings were extremely close. Um, it's noted around this time of their father chastising Philip is when he started to become withdrawn and distant. And they first noticed the shift in Philip's personality began is right around the time the dad started leaning hard on him. Philip started to pull away. And we've talked about this on a previous podcast before to where I'm like, don't, don't make your kids feel alone when they're scared. Because it's not going to help anything. If anything, it's going to make things worse. And it's going to also make your kid withdrawn from you. Your kid's not going to want to fucking talk to you. You're constantly being a dick to them because they're scared. One thing about it, he's a young kid. He's blaming himself for the move. He's feeling guilty for making his parents having to put him through these expensive treatments. He's in constant pain. Yeah, constant pain. You know he's going through some serious depression. Like uh, For an adult to go through that would be a traumatic experience let alone a little kid. Yeah, that's oh. Yeah, that's that's really rough. Yeah. No, Which it, I mean makes him further susceptible to everything that be going on. Yeah. And do this happening him being pushed to where he was isolating himself is exactly the like the perfect perfect storm for a spirit too cuz it was already dicking with him more than anything. And a lot of people speculate that it was fucking with him the most because he was He's close to death. You know, the kid's fighting a war with cancer. He's, if anything, he's got, to quote Supernatural, he's, he's, he's fucking glancing the B-side, you know? You're so close to being death's bitch that you're seeing death's other bitches. Yeah. And, like, so this kid's already in a bad spot, first and foremost, that was making him acceptable to spirits, and now he's just getting worse because now his father's fucking isolating him and blaming him for shit, right? So this is just, like, the perfect thing for whatever twisted shit was already in this house to focus even more on Philip. And it starts to oh, very yeah. noticeably tweak Philip's personality. Well, and you hear about when you're researching a lot of these stories too, you know, that ghosts, demons, poltergeists, all these different types of supernatural creatures latch on to these negative energies oh, and yeah. feed on it. And they try and make things worse. So you could imagine that even with like the father, for example, he may have started doing this because the ghosts were already sapping away at him and causing him to be a shittier parent. Yeah. Uh, now, it is noted by his older cousin, uh, Tammy, that Philip's personality, like I said beforehand, he got along great with his siblings. Fucking, they got on fantastic. Like I said, he which they chose to share a room with his little brother because they just got along that well. Uh-huh. His attitude and demeanor just got darker and more twisted uh, as the events progressed. His older cousin noted that she would constantly, at this point, have to pull Philip away from Bradley, his younger brother he shared room uh-huh. with, because he would attack him. And sometimes he would even lash out and attack Tammy, who was like five years older than him. One of the more notable incidents was uh, with Bradley was Philip put him on the embalming table and fucking constantly spun him, not letting him off no matter how much he screamed. For it, Bradley claimed that as he spun, he could see someone else in the room standing directly behind Philip. Oh. And eventually Philip... I'm sorry. They still have the embalming table? It's, it's permanently fixed. 
the embalming table is built into the floor. Like it is, it, you got to think this is a heavy piece of table and it has a drain pipe through the middle and yeah. it is fixed permanently to that room and it can free spin. So what he did is he put his brother up on the fucking table and started to fucking spin him. It would not Jeez. stop. And Bradley claims that while he was being spun, he could see the long haired man standing directly behind Philip. Like that already sounds like possession at that point. So like he said, he eventually he let Brad down. And then after that occasion, all the, tr the children tried to avoid Philip as much as possible. Bradley even eventually moves out of the room. With Philip. Uh -huh. Nobody wants to be around him anymore. Most of the haunting seemed to be located down in the basement. Brad and Tammy noticed uh, noted one time when the two youngest brothers took Tammy downstairs to see the device used to make tombstones. They were stopped dead in their tracks by a man in a gray suit with dried black eye sockets just staring at them from the corner of the room. And as he started to take step towards them, the three ran back upstairs and slammed the door behind them. Tammy said stuff like this began to happen pretty regularly that the shifting orbs of light sporadically appearing and disappearing, light fixtures turning on and off constantly in the South Coffin Room, and the family claims a small boy in a Superman pajamas would come out of a left wall, aimlessly wander around as if lost and scared, uh, and then disappear. The younger kids claim to have conversed with him and even lend him stuffed animals that he would later bring back. Oh, at least he's polite. That's well, a kid. You know, it's not a, not a fucking malevolent spirit. Yeah. It's, it seems like, if anything, he was more confused than anything. Uh, one night, Bradley and Philip woke up to three figures huddled around Bradley's remote-controlled robot. Bradley said Philip then said something to them and that it was followed up by the robot being smashed against the wall and the boy screaming. This startled their father so badly that he quickly ran downstairs with his shotgun loaded. And when he came through the door and he seen the boys laying in their bed screaming and the smash toys scattered everywhere, Brad claims his dad was clearly upset and confused, but at least this time he did not scream at them. Oof. He just promptly turned the lights off. and That's the downstairs. selling point. Yeah. He didn't scream at them. Now, before we start to applaud their dad for cranking down the dickishness, <laughs> uh, one day after paying the electric bill and being pissy, the dad came downstairs to the boys' room where they slept with the lights on, removed every single fucking light bulb from the basement, every one of them, and that very night, oh, sorry, fuck, I lost my spot again. God damn it, I'm not using my fucking highlighter. He, like I said, he removed every light bulb in the basement, every one of them, and that very night in the dark, the boys were woken by their little sister walking down into the room and flicking the lights on and off. Brad claims to have chased her out of the room and up the stairs where he was stopped by his agitated father asking what the hell he was doing running through the house in the night. Brad explains to him what happened. Uh, he notices visible anger consume his father's face as he screams at the boy, your sister's asleep in her bed. Go look for yourself. As the dad pushes open the door to show his daughter asleep with her cousins in the room. Ooh. Then he notes, I don't know what shit you're trying to pull. You know I pulled all your lights out today. That's when it hits Brad. His dad is right. There's no bulbs in their room. So him and Philip were woken up by their younger sister flicking the lights on and off when their sister's asleep and there is no fucking light bulbs to be switched on and off. Now, you know, when I say this, I didn't say anything about Philip getting the fuck out of his bed because Philip didn't give a fuck at this point. He just did not care. Was not faced by it. Did not move. Did not leave the room. Just turned around and went back to bed. At this point, it's just like Philip's just like, meh. He's given up. Yeah, well, yeah. he's just completely apathetic to the situation now. Yeah. Uh, something I should have mentioned earlier is just, uh, is about above every door in this house hung a crucifix, right? Uh -huh. That the landlord specifically told them he did not want them taking off the doorways, even if they wanted to clean them. Oh, that bastard knew. And when she asked why, he said, they're old, and I'd rather you just not. Oh. Okay? Uh-huh. And I also, I didn't mention this earlier, but the family claims that he did not tell them that it was a funeral home before they moved in. That's another thing that we're going to get into part two. Yeah, sounds about right. We're going to get into that in part two, but like he cla they claim that he didn't tell them shit about it being a funeral home beforehand. 
uh, all these faded old crucifixes would start to slowly disappear throughout the events of these hauntings. Just you would notice, the mom would notice every now and then that above a door frame would just be clearly a spot where a crucifix once hung because the paint would be fresher underneath it. Yeah. Because they've hung there the whole time, right? Uh, and up until the last crucifix vanished, most events stayed contained downstairs. But after, after that last one was gone, it was no longer the case. The whole house was free game and nobody was safe anymore. Seemingly. Because the last one to seemingly disappear was the one above the door that led to the basement stairs. And after it was gone, other people start to see, see shit. Uh, hold on one sec here. Okay, never mind. I just got a little distracted there for a second. Sorry about that. Uh, the father refused to believe any of this was real and focused all his rage on Philip, basically. That eventually led to them having Philip committed for 41 days. Oh. Is how bad it got. Jeez. An ambulance showed up and took him away and basically put him in a padded room. While Philip was being strapped into the ambulance and screaming, he screamed to his mother, Don't leave me, Mom. Don't leave me. Now they're going to come after you. As they hauled him away. That was the last thing he said to his mother. That they're going to come for her now. When, when they return to the home, the mom claims this is when everything escalated. The, the long-haired man was no longer just haunting the basement. Now he seemed to have access to the whole house. Tammy claimed that one time she got a drink from the fridge... Then about 15 minutes later, she returned for an apple only to find that everything in the fridge had spoiled in a matter of minutes. Late one night, Tammy called out for her aunt. When she entered the room, she could clearly see her niece in distress and she could see what looked like hands underneath her niece's gown very clearly groping her niece. Tammy started clutching at her rosary and praying until a black mist filled the room and tore the beads directly from her neck. Then the two ran to the parents' room, the mom and the aunt did, where the mom yelled at her husband, the house is haunted. And that very next morning, they've had enough. They called the local Catholic church where the priest told the mom, oh no, you're just, you're just imagining things. This frustrated her to no extent. She was like, how can a family, how can somebody reach out clearly distressed like that and you just dismiss it? Does it sound familiar? Yeah. What, oh, year? Like what yeah. they did to their son. She's mad because somebody is treating her like she's crazy and it's nothing. But they did that to her son until they literally committed his ass. Yeah. That next morning after that, they were told by a local family friend that there is a pair of paranormal investigators that are husband and wife. And they gave them the numbers to the Warrens who they would call promptly. Warren Watch. And that's where we will end this week's episode, part one, before the Warrens get called in. Now let's sit here and let's sit here and just talk. Let's let's. I want to I want to hear your guys' opinions on what's going on here. Well, first off, <laughs> what, you have any questions? Fans. If anything, the dad's worse than anything, but the mom's a fucking hypocrite. First yeah. and foremost, is because like you're going to be upset because a preacher or a father treated you like you're insane and just told you to be like, Poop, it'll be fine. You're just, is, you're just having overactive imagination. When you did that to your son for months until he had to be fucking committed. Yeah, oh, it's yeah. straight up emotional abuse. Another thing that I didn't mention is that towards the start of everything, her daughter, while Philip was outside playing with the neighbor boy, uh, screamed from the upstairs bedroom and claimed there was a woman with no eyeballs, this is their youngest daughter, holding out her arms like she wanted a hug. Asking her to come here. Hey, me well, the girl. mom's me first go-to is to look and be like, oh, there's a mirror that's directly facing the window. It was Philip trying to scare her. Meanwhile, oh, wow. Philip's way out in the fucking yard with his buddy. She calls him over and makes his buddy sit off the side while she chastises him. And is like, you're doing this to scare your sister. And when she explains to Philip what happens, she even notes that she could see Philip's face turn white. And then he like mousily spoke to her. He's like, he actually saw her. Like he knew who the fuck she was talking about. Like, he knew what exactly yeah. spirit she was talking about. And even though she noticed the shift in this thing, she still blamed the boy. May And fucking, she was like, don't do it again. I know what you're doing. And then afterwards, she didn't even make Philip go inside. Philip's friend came over to him and was like, are you in trouble? Your mom seemed mad. And Philip's like, no, but I want to go inside now. And Philip 
stopped playing with his friend and went down to the basement by himself for the rest of the day because he was upset. I mean, imagine being so mistreated by your family that you would rather hang out in your haunted ass basement. Yeah. Well, because I mean, he wasn't even in the goddamn house or near the window and you got drug all the way out in front of your friend to get called out. They didn't even try to be like, oh, it's just a girl's imagination playing with her. Yeah, like I'm like instantly went to it's Philip's fault. Yeah, like I'm legitimately pissed off for this kid. No, it's pretty rough. It sounds like the family harbored a lot of aggravation with him because of what his condition like. They're mad at him because they started out having to drive him 12 hours a day to the doctor and now they've had to move and they're just. This is something I want to discuss because I was really, I was going to originally discuss it in the, in the next part, uh-huh. but out of all, I, I'm telling you, I have, I researched this via tons of documentaries. There's, there's so much content for this. Tons of documentaries, articles, books, uh, just everything you can fucking think of. And the thing is, is every time you get into a new piece of content, you find another fucking detail, Right. Now, I did not find out until I started to listen to the actual book written about the event Uh that Alan is not Philip's actual father. Uh. That is the only form of media out of the documentaries, the interviews with the actual family, that it is mentioned that he is not his father. And now, mind you, when this book starts out and they talk about finding out the treatments and stuff, Alan is clearly devastated by the diagnosis of philip like he cries and this like the mom and the family doctor both get on to alan telling him that he has to suck it up because he is crying and they're like you can't be like this in front of the kid and yeah. chastise him for expressing his emotions uh so like that depicts to me that he cares about the kid but none of his actions in the actual case say that yeah and then it made me even judge it even more after finding out later on after i've done all my research that it wasn't his biological well, father and that's not shitting on stepdads because there's good stepdads yeah, out there but it yeah. just made me even squint harder at him well here's a question to, uh i have real quick when he was what is the time difference from uh, when he was diagnosed to the point that they had to move it was pretty quick because like i said after he got diagnosed they almost instantly moved into him getting cobalt treatments and it was okay. daily. So they, it, between yeah. gas prices and his mom worrying about the car ride and everything, they were like, this just isn't fucking practical. It's going to either fucking, it's going to kill him, you know? So they, they had to do it. So it was pretty, pretty abrupt. Now I told you, Alan was spending a lot of his time alone, the father, because mm-hmm. Monday through until Friday night, he was at their old apartment by himself and he would just come Friday nights and leave Sunday nights. So a lot of people are like, oh, well, you know, he, he's just frustrated because he's away from his family. And when he's with his family, it's a fucking madhouse. But let me tell you something. You are a special breed of prick. When you come home and you're mad because you had to pay a higher electric bill because your kids are scared of something. When you have them sleeping in a fucking coffin room, that you take their fucking light bulbs away. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that is straight up of abuse at that point. Can you imagine now, how dark it is in that fucking basement with no light bulbs? Yeah. yeah. I will say, and this is not defending the behavior by any means, but this is also, uh, when did this haunt take place? Uh, 19... In the 70s? Call me. It's in the 70s. Late yeah. 70s. They used to put TV ads out telling parents to hug their kids that kids were people too during that time. This is... This type of behavior is incredibly common for that time period. I'm sorry, 1986. My bad. Oh, 86. Yeah, yeah like th- these these were periods of time that people were passionate to their kids. Well, I'm just saying it was just fucking. And they actually depict in the haunting Connecticut. Now, they tr- they try to make it seem more justifiable and I'm saying this with quotes you can't see, listeners. Uh in the in the movie they don't even call him the stepdad. They make it seem like it's his biological father. Yeah. And in the movie, they play him as a recovering alcoholic. And they have it one night he breaks and drinks and he comes home drunk and they, he takes the light bulbs out of the whole house and smashes them. That was not the fucking case. There's nothing uh. in any of this literature that I read that said he had any kind of alcohol problem and it specifically said he took the light bulbs from the boys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a movie. They're trying to well, drive yeah. up the drama. They want to 
But yeah, and they're yeah, also, we're yeah. trying to make it seem like, make it more relatable. Like, oh, he relapsed. It's not his problem in that. But in this, he has, there was no anything that hinted he had any kind of alcohol problem. And like yeah. I said, he didn't take the light bulbs from everybody. He took the light bulbs from the boys. Yeah. In well, the scariest room in the goddamn house. Yeah. I mean, you know, how many people can have, have had their parents like remove their bedroom door or move the locks from their door or things like that? Like, that's a very common shitty thing that parents do. Uh, but take their light bulbs. Yeah. They live in the yeah. basement. I mean, just. I can just. Petty. Like, can you imagine? Like, you're already horrified of this place because you've seen this stuff. And, that, and you know where the scary is coming from is down the hall where you can see those glass windows, right? Yeah. And then you have that light source removed. So all you know is it's there in the dark. And now, like, I would take some comfort in being able to see it, you know, because you know where it's at. Oh, yeah. But in that basement, I imagine it was pitch black. And you can, now you can hear shit, but you don't know where. That thing could be at the foot of your goddamn bed and you don't even know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a special breed of fucking monster to do that. See, now something I think about though, and it's kind of something that bothers me with horror films as well. Um, is the ghost going to be in a way, like I can understand you're hearing things and maybe feeling things, but is the ghost going to bother showing itself if the lights are out? Because what good is it to, 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 sh to make yourself visible if well, uh, see, you can't actually be seen? With that is like, I have always wondered with Ghost, is it a choice? You know? Because, like, if you were a spirit, and a lot of these spirits, that there are good spirits out there that try to communicate with people, it would be so much easier for you to communicate if you could show yourself, right? So, is it a choice to show yourself, or is it something that just happens if you're a strong enough spirit? Like, it just, you got that, you get a, or, like, something happens in the energy, and all of a sudden you are visible. Like, maybe it's not like a, maybe he's not picking and choosing when he can be seen. Maybe it's just when he's got the right amount of juice to where he's appearing, you know? Yeah. I, I like I said, that's something we'll probably, we'll never know, like, yeah. what, what causes and everything. But I imagine if it's being seen, it's being seen. Even if you can't see it, it might still be there. It might be in the dark, in physical maybe. form. Or it might not be. It might yeah. be a choice. It might be like, I've got this much energy to where I can make myself seeable. I got to hit them when they can see me. So it makes them scared or so I can get more energy, you know, because clearly like the, the more malevolent spirits or spirits that seem to be knowing what they're doing, know that they need energy because you've got paranormal investigators or not even in cases with paranormal investigators where ghosts clearly drain energy from something, albeit a camera battery or any kind of source. They draw as much energy as they possibly can because clearly they operate well, with energy. They need something that gives them presence, gives them push. Well, and you haven't talked about what, kind of spirits we're dealing with in this um i'm sure when the warrens get there they tell the family what they're actually dealing with but as we saw with the smurl family haunting you had a demon who was riling up all the other spirits in the home yeah and so this seems like it's very much the same type of situation and you would assume in like a fu an old funeral home like this that there are a lot of spirits in this house yeah and there was there is documented of many different spirits like we talked about the woman we also talked about the man in the gray suit mm -hmm. but it seemed like the one that had the most interest in philip was the man with long hair, long hair yeah. yeah and he seemed to mainly be pe picking on philip because i'm assuming like i said i think that it was a matter of he philip's philip's uh how do i explain it philip's was closer to them more accessible to them yeah. because he had one foot on the grave yeah you know? He was so sick and so close to death and so scared of death that he was already, before they even knew that place was haunted, he was ripe for picking. Well, even if you argued that it wasn't that he was close to death that gave him energy, you could say it's just the negative energy coming yeah. from him. Yeah. Well, like the mindset, I, you know, especially at this time, you know, like cancer treatment was pretty new in this era. Yeah. Like it wasn't yeah. well researched as it is now, you know, like he basically had a death sentence. Yeah. And so to him, he's just like, I am dying. Yeah, the boy's a, a he's a, just a conduit of negative energy at yeah. that point in time because he's yeah. constantly full of anxiety. He's in pain. He's yeah. miserable. His dad's being a prick to him. Yeah, I mean he's just he's just the perfect oh and cap for negative energy. Exactly oh, yeah. what the spirits need. He's an all you can eat buffet. For all we know, for all we know, that house was not active beforehand. You know, 
It's true. He could he have. A, you think funeral home, the guy, the people that work there, death is nothing to them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It is their business, their everyday business. So like, I imagine it's hard for a spirit to get a foothold in that atmosphere. See, but, but then again, you're, again, it's a funeral home. Uh, clearly by the size, then it's a funeral home that hosts wakes and, uh, uh, they host, it's everything. It's from yeah, so the preparing the body be, to everything. I mean, it's it's. I mean, on a day on an operational basis, it's got to bring in a lot of negative energy yeah. from grieving well, families. And the weird part about that is, you got to remember, before the crucifix were gone, all the activity was in the basement. Yeah, where the only people in the basement would be well, the professionals. And here's the thing. Yeah. Here's here's some some things I'm thinking about. So the landlord obviously knew something was going on because he's. Did not want the messing with those crucifix. On top of that, something I forgot to mention yeah. is that he asked who was staying when later on when he came back, he asked the mom who's staying in the basement. Oh. Oh, and when ah. she said the boys, he was like, uh, and she was mentioned that Philip didn't want to stay down there until his brother got there. And he was like, why did he see something? Well, and here's and a, then his mom didn't think nothing of it. She was like, no. "He says that somebody talks to him down there," and he just stops and looks. And she said there was a smirk on his face, and he says, "Kids." Well, here's a question too: How much renovation did he do on this house? Because you mentioned before that he was basically turning it into a four story, you know, four room duplex, basically. Yeah, right? He specifically I, told them to leave the mortuary stuff in the basement alone. Yeah. He told them not to fuck with it. He didn't want it removed. He didn't want it nothing. It makes me think this place closed down because the people who ran the mort or the mortuary did not want to continue working there. All I know is he bought it and he originally told her he originally planned to turn it into office buildings. But the city ordinance would not let him do it. Yeah. It was only allowed to become residential. Yeah, that's uh Now we will dive more into him and the family. Yeah. In the next episode, because there's a lot more to discuss. We're gonna talk the rest of the case and then we'll dive into mm-hmm. skeptic stuff. Okay. But there is a lot more to be said about the landlord and the family as a whole. Oh yeah. And the warrants. Well, yeah. obviously people well, had experienced stuff there before because there's a reason the crucifixes were put up. Yeah. And it, clearly, he seems to know something. You know, and just to talk about it, you know, you said this was 1986, mm-hmm. and the Warrens were involved. I mean, this would have been right after the media storm with the Smurl family. Yep. So, uh, you know, that could have influenced a lot of this because they're like, like I discussed with that story, their entire street was filled with media crew, and this was brought. Their story was broadcast all over the world. Yeah. So. It could have been a case of they get to this funeral home. They realize it's a funeral home. You know what? It's haunted. We can make a story out of this. Like I said, we will we will dive into all that next time. But that will conclude the first part of our first two-parter about the Snedecker family. This has been Logan. Matt. And Bose. Thanks for taking a ride on the haunted highway with us. Remember, keep it spooky. To support other Golden Mojo Entertainment Productions, check out Golden Image Podcast, The Call Guys, and Murd Nerds wherever you enjoy listening to podcasts. To see photos and find new episodes of the United States of Paranormal, follow us on our social media, Twitter at T-U-S-O-P-P-O-D, or Instagram at the United States of Paranormal, and Facebook the United States of Paranormal. If you have a place that you'd like us to look into or would like to share your spooky story that we can read on the air, please email us at the United States of Paranormal at gmail.com.